This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. All right, folks, if you're like me, you like having the security of having your own privacy while browsing the web. Since I tend to research some creepy stuff, I wanted to throw off the people that are probably watching everything that I do. I mean, let's face it, I'm probably on some kind of NSA watch list after looking into stuff like, you know, Googling how fast do bodies decompose underwater after the Sailor Sea Foot Discoveries video, at the very least. Surfshark also keeps no data logs. They don't keep your information. Take that, CIA. And what's more, Surfshark gives you an alert that if your personal information is ever leaked online, they let you know. You can use Surfshark on all your devices, like your smart TV, phone, desktop, or laptop. I also like getting the most out of my subscription to streaming services like Netflix. Did you know Rick and Morty was on Netflix? Well, it is if you're in the UK, but not in America like I am. And the best part is that when I used Surfshark, it actually worked for getting through those stupid VPN blocks that services like Netflix puts up. Ah, run! Run, run, my baby! Bonus! In doing my own research, I also found out that one of the biggest cybersecurity publications out there put Surfshark on their list of favorite VPNs. They really liked how Surfshark is based in a country outside of the Surveillance Alliance, meaning that they are outside the reach of the CIA and NSA. I legit canceled my old VPN as soon as I tried it. It really is that good. So if you want both protection and freedom online, click the link in the description and use promo code NIGHTDOCS. It not only gives you a whopping 83% off of the regular price, but also three months of service, totally for free. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk, no excuse not to try out my favorite new VPN. Thank you so much, Surfshark. Barely perceptible, very, very low, bassy, rumbling, and pulsating hum. A diesel engine idling, uh, like a lorry ticking over or something like that. Sounded like a diesel engine, the roar of a diesel engine. The thing I noticed about it was it didn't change. The sound didn't change, like it was getting closer or further away or, or slowing down or speeding up. It was just a steady droning sound. Deep in the NBC News archives is a piece of tape not aired in over a decade. It's an episode of the Today Show from February of 2008. In an unaired part of the report, Lester Holt is standing on a bridge overlooking a gorge in Taos, New Mexico with a man named Larry Torres. Lester Holt is given a quarter and he holds it high in the air. He pauses and looks at the quarter, rotating it around almost like adjusting an antenna. The afternoon sun rays dancing off the reflective surface as Holt concentrates. The reporter for the local paper present for the scene can't hear what he says over the sound of the wind, but says Lester Holt had some kind of reaction to the experience. Whatever the noise was that the residents of Taos, New Mexico could hear, it seemed to be the strongest when standing on this bridge over the Rio Grande River, and you could even focus on it with this simple trick with a quarter. It's difficult to pinpoint an exact date of when it began, but in the early 1990s, residents began complaining about a low vibration that sounded like a distant idling diesel engine. Hearers with a musical ear all identified it as a low E flat and reported that no matter what they did, they couldn't escape it. It would be much less intense during the day, and as night approached, it would become louder and increase in intensity until the next morning. A study in 1993 was finally conducted after several local complaints. A collaboration between several scientific entities, including the University of New Mexico and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Out of the thousands surveyed, 2% reported hearing the Taos hum. The study was unable to pinpoint a source of the hum, but did note that Taos had elevated electromagnetic readings relative to other locales. What I personally find most interesting is that nobody bothered to make the connection as far as I could find between the elevated electromagnetism and the fact that one of the collaborators on the study 
the Los Alamos National Laboratory has an entire branch dedicated to studying electromagnetism. I reached out to the Director of Public Relations for the National Magnetic Field Research Laboratory with a request for comment and received no reply. Whatever the connection may or may not be, I find it hard to believe that this National Magnetic Research Laboratory, being only an hour away from the town, is just a mere coincidence. But whatever the residents of Taos were hearing, they weren't the only ones hearing a localized sound phenomenon. There are far too many localized hums, each with their own characteristics heard around the world. In the previous episode, we explored the phenomenon of the Windsor hum. Although the Windsor hum ceased with the shutdown of the blast furnaces on Zug Island, I still don't think that the blast furnaces alone were responsible for producing the ominous 35 Hz frequency hum that was heard only on one side of the river and only after 2011, despite the blast furnaces being the same ones in operation since the early 1900s. Even a former employee of the plant who spoke to me has no idea what could have been causing the hum. But underneath all of these localized sound phenomena, there's a hum that an estimated 2% of the world population can hear regardless of where they live. They call it the world hum. Not only a very beautiful environment here, but it's also a very quiet environment. At his home in the rainforest along Canada's Pacific coast, Glenn McPherson researches something that science says shouldn't exist. But it does for him. He hears it every night. Just do a brief introduction. Just uh, give me your first and last name, what your background is, and what your role is in uh, the world map. <clears throat> sure. My name is Glenn McPherson, and I live on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia. For the last eight or nine years, I've been running the World Hum Mapa Database Project. After discovering the hum for himself and finding no serious effort to catalog the phenomenon, Dr. McPherson took it upon himself to begin collecting what data he could from the public. Over the last decade, he's received data from thousands of hearers all over the world that he and a team of researchers plot on a map of the world to show where the reports are coming from. In the spring of 2012, I had uh, noted after around 10.30 p.m. a noise which sounded very reminiscent of float planes flying overhead. One night after the noise had started, I went outside and the noise stopped. I was assuming it was maybe a fridge motor or some piece of machinery inside the house. That led me on a path that ultimately led me cutting the power to the entire house. When I cut the power to the house, the sound got louder. That caused me to go out to the driveway and to sit in my car with, with the engine off. And then I could hear it. That, of course, suggested another experiment, which was to go for a drive. The first few nights I went out looking for it, I went to the natural places that you would think a hum was coming from. I checked out the sewage pumping stations, the airport, the ventilation systems on top of Michigan Tech University, any place that would generate a sound. For two kilometers, five kilometers, wherever I went at night, I could, especially in quiet areas, I could hear it. I even went up into the logging roads in the mountains near here where it was the same or even louder. Finally, I was driving like 100 miles a night in one direction looking for it. No matter where I went, the intensity was always the same. I went to Google and I typed in 
unusual low frequency humming noise. And then immediately it led to descriptions of the hum. On the first page of the results, I was led to one of the only reasonably serious scientific papers on the entire topic, written by Dr. David Deming out of the University of Oklahoma. Dr. David Deming's paper in 2004 was an early attempt to bring together some of the common knowledge and discuss some possibilities. He collected and summarized a few hypotheses from the scientific community in previous years. Everything ranging from HARP, the Aurora Research Project in Alaska that's already the source of countless conspiracy theories as it is, to natural seismic activity in the Earth. One of the theories he proposed that seemed to generate a good amount of discussion at the time was TACAMO, which stands for Take Charge and Move Out, a designation for aircraft that the U.S. military used to relay communications from the air to submarines patrolling the oceans, transmitting VLF or very low frequencies. To summarize a lot of complicated and boring research, this theory is highly unlikely simply due to the fact that those who hear the hum hear it pretty consistently, and the quieter the environment is, the more they hear it. And a plane passing overhead would most likely diminish the signal over time. In fact, this was demonstrated on the previously referenced episode of Unsolved Mysteries from 1995, when they brought a hum hearer deep underground into an abandoned mine to just see if escaping all possible radio and environmental noise would help at all. Yeah. I hear it. What do you have? I hear it uh, louder. It's more penetrating. It's actually conducting through my bones more forcefully than it does on the surface. It's very disappointing. I thought I could get away from it down under all this pot. Everywhere from an off-the-grid cabin on an isolated island in Lake of the Woods, Ontario, to Murmansk, Russia, above the Arctic Circle, to Sunshine Coast of BC here, I'd hear the exact same thing. Deming's hypothesis that the world hum had something to do with VLF was based on extrapolation of a long-known phenomenon dating back to World War II. Before you now is the radar scope, a small circular screen giving X-ray-like vision to the mysterious 11th member of the crew, the radar operator. With the new invention of radar being utilized, many people operating around radar transponders reported an odd auditory effect, hearing crackling or buzzing in their ears whenever the radar was active. The phenomenon remained largely unexplored until the 1960s, when Dr. Alan Frey studied this phenomenon, revealing that directing microwaves at a person could produce non-acoustic sounds heard only internally by a person, coining the term the microwave hearing effect. But when he took volunteers and he actually aimed microwaves directly at their foreheads, and these volunteers, every one of them, reported an unusual crackling, a popping or hissing noise. What made this research fascinating was that it could even be heard by deaf people. There were even some more bizarre experiments where what they tried to do was to take that microwave energy, modulate it with speech, with the goal of actually transmitting speech into the human skull. And there actually are some anecdotal reports of several very serious scientists who conducted this and claimed some success. So understanding the microwave hearing effect, which can produce sound from these high-frequency microwaves, Deming simply asked, if high-frequency waves can produce an auditory response, what about low-frequency waves? Why is it so outrageous to believe that VLF frequencies might, per, might cause a perception of a perceived low frequency effect. So Deming suggested a very fascinating experiment, which I actually conducted. Using a specially built steel box that's supposed to block radio waves, Glenn wants to eliminate all outside sources for the sound. And in fact, I called it the Deming box experiment. And his suggestion was to take a box, a pretty large box, big enough for a person to get in. And you get in one of the boxes, would be completely, would completely block VLF radio transmissions. I needed to investigate the a material that had the right combination of electroresistivity and electric permeability. 
that would block the ELF waves at that frequency. Part of the irony in this topic, that tinfoil hats, which are guaranteed to crack a smile. So the aliens can't read our minds? They actually work for what they claim to do. Oh. These people who wear tinfoil hats, they do it to block microwaves. This is serious. And a thin layer of foil will very effectively block microwaves. I don't know what got into me. DLF waves will sail through a, a, a thin layer of foil. So I needed to do, I needed to use whatever it was, 18 gauge, I think it is, wild steel. And I used a special radio sealed hatch for me and others to get in. He actually built this three foot by six foot steel box that blocks out low frequency sound waves. So what I created inside that box was in fact, one of the few places on earth that would be completely free of BLF radio frequencies. When we finally got around to crawling into that thing and along with a few other volunteers, we found that the hum was unaffected or got louder, which means, or at least is pretty convincing evidence that the electromagnetic radiation does not directly cause the hum. As difficult as it must have been to try this experiment only to have it fail, it at least narrowed down the list of possible causes to the world hum. The fact that the Deming box blocked all electromagnetic waves was an important clue, revealing that whatever the world hum was, it had nothing to do with electromagnetism. When you visit the hum.info and analyze the data which you can freely download, there's some interesting patterns. One is that there's a disproportionate amount of reports from English-speaking countries. But that's simply due to the fact that until very recently, the site was only in English. And as the site has opened up to more languages, reports have been coming in. The second is quite perplexing. It turns out, not everyone who hears the hum perceives the same frequency. So it's a crucial question that we ask people who report to the database is to go to an online tone generator, such as onlinetonegenerator.com, and actually match what you're hearing. Stop and listen for the hum, then go to your tone generator, move the slider, move it up, move it down, and okay, what frequency are you perceiving? And it's all over the board. And you see that never, like that never happens with the standard acoustic source. So have you ever had anybody that lost their hearing like they had perfect hearing at one point and then something happened and they are completely deaf or something like that or severely limited and still hear the hum by the way i i, I watch and listen to a lot of interviews on tv and i'm always really annoyed when the person answering comments on, on what a good question it is that always annoys me <laughs> having said that what a great question because that 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 reveals a lot and yes there are deaf people or hard to hear people who hear the hum that says a lot. It does. So at this point, many may ask the question, is this all a delusion? A popular belief among people who do not hear the hum is that this is a simple case of mass hysteria. The problem with subscribing to the belief that this is some kind of mass delusion is simply the fact that most people reportedly discover the world hum map after researching this phenomenon themselves after having experienced it. Simply put, you can't give in to a mass delusion like this without being aware that it exists in the first place. There's no way this can be a coincidence that we all are hearing or slash perceiving the same thing under the same conditions. This is not a hallucination, nor is it any form of mass hysteria. And by the way, increasingly now, we have doctors, dentists, lawyers, engineers, audio uh, who reported. When we analyze the data of who reported to have heard the world hum, we find an interesting pattern. As we approach the middle of the pack of respondents, we find most of them to be in the same age range. And what's especially interesting to me is how closely this graph resembles a normal distribution curve. Now, there are numerous factors to take into consideration, namely the likelihood of someone choosing to take the survey in the first place in accordance with their age. For example, someone in their late 70s or 80s may not be as inclined to even use the internet as much as someone in their late 20s. 
It's also worth mentioning that Glenn and his team have been extremely thorough and take significant steps to differentiate and identify people who are hearing the world hum from a localized sound phenomenon like the Windsor hum. Like the Windsor hum, for example, is not the hum, but the world hum, no doubt, was operating there as well. So, for example, anybody who reports to the reports to my database who reports a perceived frequency at anything close to 120 hertz, we now we might be throwing out a few babies with this bathwater, but we just immediately reject that. This person is hearing the mains hum, that is through a transformer, through a heat pump, through some other device. And it's possible to use a few of the diagnostic questions to sort out what one is hearing. One of the really fascinating characteristics of the world um, is that air travel di disrupts it for three or four days. It completely air disrupts. Wait, air travel? Oh, it disrupts the, the your perception of hearing the hum? The hum disappears for three, three or four days after significant air travel, like two or more hours in the air. The hum disappears. So let's briefly recap some of the evidence. The hum can be heard most easily when it's quiet. The hum can be heard consistently, no matter where a hearer is geographically. It's unaffected by electromagnetism. Hearers all perceive different frequencies. The hum can be heard by deaf people. And the hum is disrupted after air travel, presumably due to changes in pressure. So it's time to finally answer the million dollar question. And short of having a formalized peer review scientific finding, I feel like we have the answer. Would it be possible that it's maybe triggering your auditory nerves rather than an actual compressed airwave, like an actual sound hitting your eardrum? That's the most crucial question you could possibly ask. So it's my contention, and I have excellent reason to believe this, that the hum is in fact, the world hum is not a sound in the classic sense of the word. Everyone who suffers from tinnitus hears a different bass frequency. That's because everybody's anatomy is different. Everybody's medical history is different. This leads me to believe that um, the hum is also internally generated. In summation, I feel pretty confident that the world hum, and remember, it's a completely different sound phenomenon than localized hums like the Windsor hum and the Taos hum. The world hum is most likely a type of unacknowledged low frequency tinnitus. And just as tinnitus sufferers all perceive a different sound frequency, so do hearers of the world hum. Now, in my case, it's been stable over time. I perceive what, uh, what seems to match to around 56.5 hertz on you. Everyone who suffers from tinnitus hears a different bass frequency. That's because everybody's anatomy is different, everybody's medical history is different. If I were to play for you or anybody else, let's say a 35 or 39, 40 hertz tone, and then asked you to go to a piano keyboard and then match that tone, you would all match to the same tone because you're all hearing the same tone. And just as tinnitus becomes more common as we advance in age, whether because of hearing damage or simple anatomy, the world hum seems to manifest later in life and becomes most noticeable when you get away from all the busy noise and commotion that exists in modern society. And just as tinnitus behaves, it is disrupted by air travel or changes in air pressure. And yes, there are deaf people or hard of hearing people who hear the hum. That says a lot. It does. Yeah. In other words, same thing with tinnitus. And that is, there are deaf people who perceive it, that high-pitched squeal. We believe that it's an internally generated perception of noise, and that it's, it is not an external noise, even though the two can often be completed. I also need to ask you two questions. Every interviewer has to go through this. Sure. Do you believe people who report tinnitus? Yeah, absolutely. Second question, why do you believe them? I think it's a shared experience that's shared by enough people that it, which is why I actually believe that there is such a thing as the world hum, because there are enough people that have reported to have had it independent of one another, that there is something there. So, right. yeah. And so the, of course, the, my, my rhetorical question in response is, if we automatically believe people who self-report a high frequency noise, 
Why then would we not believe people automatically who report, who self-report a low frequency noise? And the reason is precisely what you just pointed out. It's a question of proportion. Upwards of 80 to 85% of the population have had transient tinnitus. Whereas we're looking at somewhere between two to 4% of the population has experienced the hum under the right conditions and knowing what they're listening for. And so therefore that also leads us to a philosophical point which you might be interested in. That is reality itself has a democratic component. If I were to tell you or a room full of people that I see purple rats running up the wall, they'd look at me and say, you are hallucinating. That is a psychosis. But if I self-report a high-pitched squeal, which nobody else can hear, they all say, oh, you have tinnitus. What's the difference between the two? The difference is precisely what you pointed out, is that it's such a shared experience, whereas the hum is not. And for those of you wondering, why are people just now identifying the hum? Surely there must be some correlation with cellular towers, power lines, or some other man-made interference that can affect our auditory senses. Well, it turns out the world hum is far from new, with possible reports dating back hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Times of London goes back to the 1790s. And what's really interesting is that digging through that entire horror of historical data, one finds some intriguing news entries. For example, there's more than one entry to referring to the, the swarm of bees. Now, you, you do want to say interesting. That, you do know that in 1790, if you do the history on the Industrial Revolution, in 1790, this is before the advent of modern gasoline and diesel engines. Yeah, and electronics yeah. and all of that. Therefore, can you imagine the challenge it is to go searching? What it, What are your search terms then? Yeah, So uh, you don't have anything to compare it to. It was agonizing or tedious at, at best. And I went through it. And now over several decades, I, heard several, I saw several references to these, what sounded like a distant, what the people reported some of the distant massive swarm of bees. So what would it take to officially solve this mystery and confirm what we think we already know? To bring this project to its fruition, I need one of two things to happen. Basically the same thing. One thing to happen is if either a serious university lab or a private lab, private corporate lab to pick this up. And if, they, if either of them, those things happen, this thing will be solved within a year and then I can get back to my life. I can tell you I can tell you one thing that we need the hum here is to get into a functional MRI machine. Not an MRI, but a functional, like an fMRI. If we took the MRIs of 50 hum hearers and 50 non-hum hearers and gave them to an external radiologist and ENT, like the ear, nose, throat specialist, and say, are there any differences between these groups that that might pinpoint an anatomical difference. If we could also get the EEG machine hooked up, it could be that we could actually see an EEG spike at perceived frequency. If I hook you up to an EEG and I play a strong, let's say 40 Hertz note, there will be a 40 Hertz spike on the EEG, which is quite remarkable, by the way. The question is, if I were hooked up to the EEG under the right conditions, could you beat the 56.5 Hertz spike on my EEG. That would be a dramatic piece of evidence. We have a postdoctoral researcher at a major German, major German university, who insists that he remain anonymous for now, but they're hot on the heels of this. An actual final, a university laboratory uh, in Germany is taking this on slowly. If we're right, we're talking about a medical condition that has gone completely unacknowledged possibly throughout history. Something that we're finally only now starting to know of its existence due to the ease of information sharing in the modern day. The evidence to me seems clear. The hum is real and is the cause of distress and discomfort for many people throughout the world. If the wider scientific and medical community will acknowledge its existence, it could hopefully pave the way for many people suffering from this condition to finally start seeing research into treatment 
well, this is a game of normalization. And again, if I wasn't able to put doctor in front of my name, then in granted, I'm not even a scientist. I never claimed to be. We wouldn't have got as far as we have. So I'm basically, finally, my PhD is good for something. Yeah. And that I, I have used it in the academic world, of course, in my books and my academic writing, but that's all mathematics education and in mathematics diagnosis and remediation, that kind of thing. So we're working on it. That, that is normal. It's normalizing this. I'd like to thank Dr. Glenn McPherson for taking so much of his time to give me his unique perspective, both as a hum hearer and for the years he's spent in intense research into this mystery. And I'd like to thank you for watching this. I know part two is a long time coming and many of you thought that I'd really never get around to finishing this. I hope I've earned a subscription or a like on the video as well as a recommendation to your friends. If you're a longtime viewer and you would like to support these deep dives into fascinating and bizarre mysteries, you can become a financial supporter on patreon.com slash Believe me, it goes a long, long way to helping me dedicate the time that it takes to make these, and I'm very grateful for those of you who already support. Be sure to also follow me on Twitch, where I stream not only games, but editing, research, as well as music production for these videos. It's a fun way to be a part of all this and give me input as I'm working. Not a God! Shit! No! Out of the darkness, we can all find light. But for now, this is Nidox, signing off.